I want you to give a big welcome to Caleb. Praise God. He's got the word of the Lord this morning. I've had a, a bit of a taster of what he was going to say, and it's about revival, isn't it, Caleb? Amen. The revival move of God. Glory to Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. How many of you are happy to be in the house of God today? A few hands not up. Amen. It's good, isn't it? And we've just been seeing so much. We've been talking so much about revival every Sunday, right? And that's something that I feel God, I was, I was talking to Pastor Karen through the week, and I just felt like God's got his foot on the gas of revival, and he is not letting up. So get with the program, all right? <laughs> or get left behind. So we're going to go ahead, and we're going to talk about a few things. Um, but one of the things that God put in my heart is revival begins in the mind. And for those of you who can't see that subtitle, it says, How to Put on the Helmet of Salvation. All right? How to Put on the Helmet of Salvation, A Call to Repentance. Okay? And, and this is something every revival, right, in, the, in history, and I've, I've read a lot, I've studied a lot of revivals, they all begin with repentance. Okay? And repentance is not sackcloth and ashes. It's not a lot of things. So I've got a funny video next, uh, just to tell you what repentance isn't. Uh, but we'll, we'll play that if the media team can do that, and I'll come back. Dad's in the religion, but boy, if a man get in your face, knock him down, repent later, but bust him in the head. <laughs> My grandpa used to tell me that. Look, boy, don't take the dick none off no one. Just just knock their head off. I said, but it's a sin. We'll, we'll repent. <laughs> My mama said, Daddy, don't you tell Jesse to do that? <laughs> but she always honored her father. He said, she, he said, I don't want nobody beating up my grandson. He said, I'll tell you something, boy. If you get whipped, I'm going to whip you when you get here. I said, okay, Papa. I ain't let nobody whip me. And the next day, some guy got in my face. I hit him with a baseball bat. Whack! Down he went, son. Boy, the teachers come to get me. I said, y'all want some of this? Come on. My Papa said, I'm going to repent in a few minutes, but I'm going to knock some head here. Yeah. I, mean, I, I was in the seventh grade. Got suspended. Why did you do that? I said, it's Pawpaw's fault. And my grandpa went, I didn't think he'd do what I told him to do. Well, my mama beat the fire out of me. Went down there and begged school to get me back in. My guy went back to my grandpa's house two days later. He said, come here, boy. And he said it in front of mama, took me in the backyard. He said, I'd have done the same thing. <laughs> I said, why didn't you stand up for me? He said, hey, man, you know, I don't want to get involved in your family business. <laughs> I said, you almost got me killed, Papa. <laughs> oh, you'll make it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> this is a true story. I just believe what he said, man. Hey, grandpa said, do it, we do it. It's amazing how your dads and your mama say, what's the matter with you, boy? Your daddy worried about how much it's going to cost. Say, I ain't paying for this, boy. <laughs> but your mama said, you're going to kill somebody. And your dad said, yeah, boy. Shouldn't they hit that, you hit him with a bat? <laughs> <laughs> to knock him down one leg, did you? Yeah, I bet he, he went out like a light, did he? <laughs> and then your mama, don't glorify that. Oh, uh, boy, you shouldn't have done that, son. <laughs> Fathers are bad about that stuff. One time, two girls called my house, and they was mad, and they said, is Jesse there? And my daddy thought, he, he, he said, I don't know nobody named Jesse. <laughs> he figured, oh, God, man. Mama said, you lying, Paul? That's your son? Listen, there's two girls, man. I don't know what's going on. We got to protect this boy. <laughs> How many of you men done that? Don't lift your hand, man. <laughs> Take heed what you hear. I'm back on this sermon. Take heed what you hear. Amen. So I just thought it's nice to laugh, isn't it? It's nice to get, get a bit of laughter in. Um, so praise God. Um, so I'm going to be going through five, uh, five points that the Lord put on my heart. Um, five things that we need a change in mindset of, all right? Five things. And the first thing is repentance from deficiency. I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but that's a coffee cup that's overflowing, all right? <clears throat> And I'm going to talk through, uh, Crystal said to me, it's a very humbling message, Caleb. I said, yes. I'm going to talk through five failures in my life, in my thought process that God had to correct. 
Okay, and the first failure that I'm going to talk through is with, when I was applying for university, and the first thing I did was. Um, do you know the story? Do you know when people say, "Oh, just, just uh, you know, stretch your leg as as far as your blanket will go. Don't go any further, right?" And that was my mindset when I was applying to go to university. And that's something that God had to change because a mindset of poverty prepares for lack. Okay, a mindset of poverty is always thinking, "How am I going to save for a rainy day? How am I going to put this aside in case I need it?" And, and, and there's always a preparation for lack. So that's a mindset of poverty. But a mindset of abundance prepares for harvest. The difference between poverty, a mindset of poverty and abundance is preparing for lack and preparing for a harvest, okay? And so God began to, to speak to me and and for a very long time, you know, uh, I, I kind of shared part of my story before, but I applied, and I'll, I'll do it again for, for those who knew or who haven't heard it before, but I applied to go to Germany, and I got into one of the best universities there. The reason I applied to go to Germany was because it was cheap. <laughs> All right, that was the main reason. <laughs> I'll be honest and say it was cheap. And I thought, ooh, uh, we can afford this. This is good. And I applied to go into the university, and, um, and yeah, it took me a year. And it was, it was constant, you know, battles and things not working out and there's you know it took a year to finish that application and I finally got in right I got into a really good university and then uh, the German government rejected my visa and they never even gave me a reason they just rejected my visa and I was like what why is this right and at the time I remember God saying to me I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is fixed in me because he trusts in me right and I just trusted God and and, and the Lord showed me there was um then, uh, you know, we began to reapply, and I had two options. I could go to Canada, or I could go to the UK. And then again, I went, mm, Canada is slightly cheaper. You know, that, that might be better for us. Uh, and the Lord said to me, no, no, you're going to go to the UK. He gave me a dream, and he showed me the building that I studied in. He showed me the glass doors of that building opening, you know, and I was like, whoo, you know, like this, where is this, you know? And, and, and at the time, and I've said this before, Queens had a Q logo with a crown in it, right? I saw that crown in a dream four months before I, I even went there, right? And and it was just like a dream and the Lord showed me and and, and I applied to Queens and Queens rejected me. <laughs> but let me tell you something, a mindset of 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 overflow, you know, of abundance prepares for a harvest. I didn't stop my preparation. I was still looking up and I was looking at all the dormitories and where I was going to stay, you know, and all of this. And uh, uh, maybe a couple of days later, Queen's sent me another letter saying, actually, we do have a place and it's in a, you know, they gave me a scholarship. Uh, they took off X amount, you know, of my, my uh, like my fees. And like, I think I saved about 9,000 pounds in that first year loan, right? But, but I was trying to see where the cheapest place was because I was trying to stretch my leg according to the blanket that I have. And that's something that God has taught me in the recent time is stop doing that. It's very important as Christians to live in that overflow, right? We're not supposed to live when the cup is half full or the cup is full, Right? It doesn't say, you know, David did not say that when, you know, he anoints my head with oil and my cup is filled up or my cup is half full. What does it say? He says, my cup overflows. If God is anointing you, let me tell you, church, you will live in the overflow zone. That's how you know it's God, when you live in that overflow zone. So, um, you know, and, 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 and people have all sorts of things to say about this, but let me tell you, um, you know, David had one of the most amazing revelations, okay, on, on giving. And David just lived this, this, and, and you see that, and you know, I don't think Solomon, right? Yes, Solomon was blessed because he asked for wisdom, but I think a lot of it came from his father. He had an inheritance of wealth. He had an inheritance of the understanding of who God is, because David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David did not say, I shall not need, okay? David says, I shall not want want. And there's a big difference. And, and some people say, oh yeah, yeah, you know, all of your needs will be provided. That's not what the verse says. The verse says, he will provide all my needs according to his riches in glory. <laughs> it's funny how we like, sometimes just read the Bible and we cut off, you know, bits of verses. That's not what it says. It says he'll provide for my needs according to his riches and glory. Not according to my expectations, not according to my length of the blanket. <laughs> he'll provide according to his riches and glory. So, um, one of the things that, you know, and, and 
I, mean, I, I have kept saying this over and over again. I love, you know, finances and I love like investing and I love, you know, just, just in that, you know, living in that no lack zone. It's amazing. Let me tell you, when you live in a no lack zone and people look at me going, you're only 23. Do you know most 23 year olds in my position are in serious debt out of university, right? But I don't, I, I'm debt free. And that's because I love living in that no lack zone. And that's where God is calling us to live. You know, and um, and the, the, you know, I, I was kind of reading um, some very rich and famous, you know, um, speakers. I was kind of reading, um, you know, what they say about, uh, you know, finances and all of this. And do you know that a lot of the rich people they don't save? How many of you know that a lot of people who are really, really rich they're not saving? They're investing. That's why when something goes wrong, they go completely bankrupt because they don't save. They invest. Right? The difference between them and us is this. We're supposed to invest, but God protects our investment. Right? It says, store up for yourselves. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. It's on the next slide. But, but uh, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. God is looking for us to give an eternal investment, okay? And the best way to do that is through finances, okay? And a lot of people get very upset when you talk about, oh, you know, you're talking about prosperity, you're talking about this, you're talking about that. Listen, I've lived it. I am a living, walking example that God blesses till your socks are full, <laughs> all right? God blesses till you have no place in your pockets and it's overflowing, all right? That is how God God blesses, and that's where God is calling us to live. And so, um, you know, and Jesus tells us a story, and, and I, I really want to drive this point home. And, uh, you know, Jesus tells us a story about this man he gave talents to, uh, you know, and, uh, and basically what he did was um, he said to, he, he gave talents, there's, there's this man who gave talents to three of his servants, uh, and he gave different amounts. And the one he gave the least amount to, okay, what he did was he dug a hole and he hid it there. Okay, he didn't invest it. He saved it for a rainy day. He closed it up. He did not invest. Okay, he put it in and he stood on it and he said, right, when the master comes, he moved aside, he dug it up and gave it to the master. And the master says to him in Luke 8, 18, therefore take heed how you hear. For whoever has to him more will be given and whoever does not have even what he seems to have will be taken away from him. You know, living in this mindset of no investment, of only saving for a rainy day, of only, you know, of, of all this, this, this preparation for, for lack, God doesn't like that. God doesn't like that. And, 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 and there's biblical, and I can give you, I, I mean, I was looking, Luke 8, 18, the same thing Jesus said, it's, all, it's recorded across all four Gospels, okay? Uh, I mean, it's very rare that the same incident is recorded exactly the same way across all four, and it's recorded across all four Gospels. The reason being, God hates waste. And for God, when you're saving for a rainy day, when you're preparing for lack, you're wasting the resources he's given you. God counts, you know, fear of lack, Okay? Waste. <laughs> and so God hates that. Um, so, you know, and, and, and the Lord was just showing me, you know, uh, and I've said this before, 2 Corinthians uh, nine ten, which says, you know, he gives seed to the sower and bread. Okay? He gives seed to the sower and bread for food. A lot of people are eating their seed, okay, and eating their bread. <laughs> That's not going to leave you very healthy. <laughs> All right? And there's a lot of people then who are giving their seed and giving their bread. And that's also not okay. Right? There is a balance. You need to ask the Holy Spirit, right, how much. And, and I've said this before. Sometimes I will have very little in my bank account. And the Holy Spirit is like, give it all. I'll be like, right, okay. <laughs> and then I'll give it all, right? Because he said seed. And immediately he brings in a blessing of abundance. You know, he brings it in straight away. And my bank accounts are, you know, my friends laugh at this when I say it's a rolling bank account. <laughs> you know, it's not a current account. So I say it's a rolling account. The Lord gives me something that goes out. Fresh stuff comes in. And the more that goes out, the more that comes in. All right? And so that's... Um, that's just how we're supposed to live, right? We're supposed to live where we're giving seed. God is giving us seed to give seed, all right? To plant, to plant. It's not so that we can put it in a ground, in, in, a, in a hole and just leave it there and forget about it, you know? And so um, that was the first thing. So God changed my, my mindset, you know? My, my first, the first failure I had was a mindset of lack, 
as the longest one I've had victory over, okay? And so that's why I'm beginning to see, uh, you know, the miraculous in my life in this area, because I'm learning more and more. I'm learning how to, to appropriate what God has, has already provided. But the next one that I've learned more recently is repentance from infirmity, okay? Um, repentance from infirmity. The word infirmity comes from the word infirm, not strong, not planted, not rooted. That's the word infirm, okay? And this is something that I believe, um, you know, uh, that a lot of us, you know, have gone through at some point of our time, uh, of our lives, and this is another failure that I had relatively recently, okay? But when I say failure, you know, God's so gracious and so merciful that he, he corrects us straight away. He doesn't let that failure take root in my life because I'm open to him doing that, right? If you tell him, come in and change my heart, he'll not let a failure stick, all right? It says, the Bible says, a righteous man falls seven times, but seven times he shall stand up again. Okay, so I've been speaking a lot about healing, and I've been ministering a lot about healing and healing and listening to healing. I go to sleep. Uh, I saw Paul and Dinah this. I go to sleep with, like, healing scriptures playing. Okay, and so that's how I fall asleep nowadays. But, but one of the things that happened a few weeks ago was um, I've been, uh, I've had, you know, seven surgeries in my back. And about a few, and, and I've been healthy, and about a few weeks ago, I called Tony, because uh, I had, um, I suddenly had, I was sitting on the ground at a friend's house, and I suddenly shot up, because I had a severe pain, like someone had taken a knife and just ripped open my back, and I just stood up, and I was like, this reminds me of something, <laughs> you know, and then I began to think of what had happened in the past, and I got, I got, I got into this rabbit hole, you know, of thinking, oh, you know, how, how did I fight it the last time? You know, what did I do that was different? And I started comparing where I was right now with where I was two years ago. And God shut it down very quickly, right? <laughs> God shut it down very quickly. And, and he began to teach, he began to say to me, why do you confess the word? That is a question I want to ask you. Why do you confess the word? And in, in our church, we believe, we believe that it is always God's will to heal. We will not change from that. Pastor Brian shaking his head. I'm so glad I'm in a church like this. We believe, hallelujah, that God will not change his word. It is always God's will to heal here. Here. Amen. So, so, so then we, we confess the word. And, and the Lord said to me, why are you confessing the word? He asked me the question, why are you confessing the word? I was thinking, right, why am I confessing the word? Is it because you're thinking by confessing the word, you'll get healed? Is that the mindset you're going back to? Because I came from that mindset. We don't confess the word because we shall be healed. I know a lot of people, you know, they pray and they say, yeah, I believe one day I will be healed. I will walk out of that wheelchair. I will do this and I will. And, I'm, and that is amazing. That's a good starting point, right? But that's not what the word says. The word says, by his stripes, you were healed. It's past tense. When you go from, and then, and then what, what happens to, you know, what happens to all those symptoms you have? And I still had those symptoms. And the Lord changed that mindset. And, well, I had that mindset. I went back. You know, the Lord brought me back to it. And, 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 um, and as soon as I changed that mindset, I began to laugh at the devil. I was like, oh, you're trying this trick again. You know, he, the devil's like an old pony. He only has two tricks, let me tell you. One's deception and the other one's also deception. That's all he has. All right? <laughs> the devil, devil has no extra tricks up his sleeve. Okay, and so he came back. And the next day, when the Lord reset that in my mind, I got up, I went, went for a shower, and I was just wiping my back. I felt something wet, so I took a wee, um, a wee uh, you know, toilet paper, and I just wiped like my back, my lower back, and there was like blood on it. What do you do with that? So I went downstairs and I got a bottle of ketchup and I brought it upstairs and I poured it on another bit of toilet and I said, look devil, I can do it too. <laughs> you know, you're lying. I can do it too. I am not scared of, of, this, of this manifestation. You can take it back to where it came from because it's having no effect on me. And you begin to laugh at the devil and his childish games. <laughs> you know, um, it's just, I mean, the devil's funny. Like the other day, um, you know, I was at a worship night and, and my friends were with me and, <laughs> and suddenly someone in the back, and the devil has all these weird manifestations, someone in the back on the side started roaring, you know, I don't know what was, what sort of a manifestation. And I just started laughing and my friends look at me and they go, why are you laughing? I was like, because I can roar too. I should do that when I was 10. He should do something more mature, you know, because like, he's such a joke. 
you know, and when we begin to live that life, when we understand what the word says, when we begin to confess the word and believe it exactly as it says it. It says you were healed. It doesn't say you will be healed. It doesn't say you shall be healed. It says you're being healed. It says you were healed. It's a done deal. So that's how we do. And and you know, um, um, and and this this uh, this next sermon point I actually got from a friend. Uh, it was he was talking about how um, you know when COVID came, a lot of Christians, you know, even faithful Christians, I fell ill with COVID, um, and um, and when I fell ill with COVID, you know. I only got, I mean, through him, I got this revelation. I was like, why, why did you fall ill with COVID? Why did you get COVID? Uh, something that he said that the Lord spoke to him was that by hearing and hearing and hearing about COVID, it began to make a dent in his faith. All right? Uh, people who were listening to the BBC on repeat, right? And they were listening to everything and all the stats and every And I was one of those people. I used to check every day what the stats were at the start. And that's when the enemy had started to get a foothold. All right? When you begin to listen to the media, or some people call them the Midianites, you know, the Midianites, you know, you begin to operate in the spirit of the Midianites. We're not supposed to operate and we're supposed to drive out the Midianites. That is our calling, all right? So whenever the media says, oh, we're in an economic crash, you know, we, we're seeing this global pandemic, we're seeing this, we're seeing that, you take the word and you hit it back, right? You do not. You switch off the TV. God's made it so easy. He's given us the idea of a remote. Switch it off. You know, you have to move, sit, and just press the button and it goes off. Switch it off, you know, and stop listening to the world because the economic system of today works by fear. All right? This is something that I have read into a lot. And one of the things that God has showed me is the economic system of today works by fear. All right? Um, uh, how many of you have heard of a guy called Elon Musk? You know, he's, he's a very brilliant philanthropist. And, you know, anyway, Elon Musk... Um, would sometimes say on Twitter, you know, he would tweet something about a certain share price and everyone would rush to buy it or everyone would rush away from it and it would rise and fall because they thought, oh, this man knows what he's talking about and there was fear created and that's how the economic system of this world, I work in stocks, right? I know how they work and it's all based on fear. You'll see that the, the stocks rise and fall based on when the news announces something. That's literally how it works. That is why we are supposed to be rooted and grounded in the word. Because when you are, the word is firm. It doesn't move. Okay? It keeps us firm. And, and the best application is healing. You know, and um, so obviously I've spoken about Romans 10, 7. It says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. And Proverbs 23, 7, which is even more important, it says, for he for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. This is a mindset. We need to repent from how we've been thinking about ourselves. We've been thinking about ourselves as, I'm only human. I'm just a man. I'm just this. I fall ill. Oh, yeah, it's all right. You know, it's all right. We, after all, we're only humans. No, you're not. You, you're not only humans. You've got the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. One third of the Godhead living on the... That is amazing, church. You're not only humans. You know, the Bible says he has made us a new creature. All things have passed away. All things have become new. So turn around and tell someone, I'm a new creature. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah, so, so we're, all, we're all new creatures and we, we don't walk by, by what we see. We, and we begin to think based on what the word is saying. And that is the best way to deal with sickness, the best way to deal with infirmity in our life. All right? Um, and then the next point I kind of want to touch on, um, and this is a big one, for, was a big one for me, has been a big one for me, and it is repentance from performance. You know, I've got a horse there running, but I think, um, you know, and this is failure number three, uh, and it actually happened relatively recently. So I'm going to have to leave out some of the details because I don't know who will watch this. <laughs> uh, but, um, okay, I'll, I'll say it. I, I was in, in work and um, last two, two Mondays ago, and 
and um, I, you know, my, my boss had set me something to do on the Wednesday evening, right? Wednesday afternoon. He's in America. Now, when he said something in the afternoon, I'm already off work, so I only see it on Thursday morning. So he set me about three tasks to do, and he never told me when to do it by. So he said, and I, and I started, you know, working on it and, you know, doing it at my own pace. I've just joined the job, so I'm, there's a lot to learn. And I'm one of those people. Um, I'm a big performance person, and God's been dealing with that a lot, but it's, I, I like perfection. You know, and perfectionism can sometimes, it's a good thing sometimes, but sometimes it can really hurt you, right? And, you know, and so I was like reading everything, but I wasn't really touching the word. I was like, let me know everything there is to know about this before I put my hand to it, you know, and because I want it to be perfect. And I finished a couple of the tasks, and then Monday out of the blue, he just called me, and he goes, um, have you been getting on? And I said, well, I finished this, 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 and I just have this left. And he looks at me and goes, yeah, well, I'm a bit disappointed you haven't finished that. And I felt like a ton of bricks on my head. I was like, oh, he's disappointed. And immediately the mentality of performance kicked in. Oh my goodness, I'm not good enough for this. This is a new job. You know, oh my, how am I gonna, how am I gonna do this? How am I gonna, and the mentality of, you know, I have to perform. And I was praying and I was believing God and I began to think, yeah, you know, God won't defend me because I haven't performed. That's such an awful way to think, right? But it happens to you in the heat of the moment. You begin to, you lose your focus, you know, and, and that has to be a thought. You have to repent from that thought process. You know, what is repentance? Repentance is walking like this. That's repentance. That's literally it. It's not sackcloth and ashes. It's a turn of the mind. And, uh, and one of my closest friends, his girlfriend is in Australia. And I went to sleep on the Monday night, and I was really, really upset. Like, I went to sleep, and, like, I was, yeah, I, was, I just was out of it. And, and I was, you know, and, and I had this, uh, I call it the only child syndrome. It kicks in sometimes where you, you begin, oh, there's no one else I can talk to about this. And, you know, I forget that the creator of the universe is in my bedroom. And then, you know, the only child syndrome starts kicking in. And, and I was all very, I was all very upset and, you know, um, and, um, and I went to bed, and now she's in Australia, right? And about one o'clock in the morning, I must have fallen asleep. Um, and the next morning, I woke up because she was praying. It was it was in the morning. It was the daytime for her, and the Holy Spirit told her specifically to pray for me into my situation, right? And He told her exactly what to pray for, and she sent me a lovely message, um, you know. And and uh, it was basically from the book of Daniel, and He says, "From the first day you began to pray, I had already given you the victory," you know. And and that and 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 she began and she she prophesied, and then I was like, "Oh yeah, this happened." And <laughs> I get a voice note from her praying in tongues, and then giving me an interpretation, and I. I was like, hallelujah, this is so good. And, uh, and in that moment, God started to tell me, I'm defending you. And I thought, what? Because when I was raised up, you know, and obviously, you know, human parents raise you different, right? And God has a very different, and sometimes there are discrepancies, and sometimes we, we take those on. And so I was always raised, mom and dad always said to me, if it was your fault, even a little bit, we aren't defending you at all, right? So if I had, if I had a small, f so I had to be good, right? For them to come and defend me, I had to be right, right? And so that builds a mindset. Okay, and that builds a mindset in your kids that you always have to be right. Okay, and, 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 and we do all the time. And so, you know, in the world system, yes, but that's not how it works with God. And you know, Abraham, um, Abraham <laughs> was a big liar. He lied. He lied to a king, and God still defended him. He struck the king. <laughs> and, and the Lord reminded me, and he said, listen, you may not have done 100% to the best of your ability, but I am still going to defend you, right? And so I began to work through the day, and I finished, and I, I, whatever he said to me, I did that and extra. You know, I just did everything, and I was like, let's just get it all done. And he called me at the end of the day. He called a team meeting, and he asked me what I did on the team meeting. So I said, I did this, 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 and I finished everything you asked me to do, and I did this extra. And he was like, oh, that's so good. And, you know, he began to, like, praise me on the team meeting. And then we got off the team meeting. He said, send me the results. I sent him the results, and he goes, oh, that's so good. You've done a fine job, and, you know, all of this. And... And inside, I was like, you know, God was defending me right through. You know, I believe God was working through the night. When I was asleep with my only child syndrome, God had kept someone awake in a different continent to pray for me. You know, and God had given them a word for me. And God was, so God will defend you even if you're not 100% there yet. Because that's what the, the Bible tells us. Jesus is our mediator. 
All right, and so we need to get out of this mindset of performance. You know, um, Colossians two six says, "As you have received Christ, so walk ye in Him." And <laughs> sometimes we we will kind of you know we, we receive Christ by grace and faith. Once you receive Christ, it's all different. You have to do all these these things, and you have to be perfect. You know, for, and and that's that's just not how it works. That's not how it works. We are called to. To, to walk in grace and faith in our Christian world. We don't stop once we accept Jesus. You know, um, and um, there's, there's two other verses I had up there, and one was Zechariah 4, 6 and 7, but it says, It's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, this mountain shall be removed. Right? So whenever we are faced with an issue and a challenge, stop trying to perform and let God move the mountain. Because it is not by might, it is not by power, but by his spirit. And this is something we need to change our mind to. Because when God, when God has started this revival, Bible, and when we're in the thick of it, it's going to become very easy to start performing, right? And, and, and it, it'll be easy for someone up here to perform. It'll be easy for someone on worship to perform. It'll be easy for someone at the back on media. It all becomes a performance, but it's not by our performance. We can never, ever attribute anything to our performance, you know, and... Um, and, uh, you know, Hebrews 9.40, and this is something you know, we, really need to, we really need to focus on. I'm going to read this verse and move on. But it says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Holiness comes by understanding the sacrifice of Jesus and having your conscience purged. It does not come by dead works, all right? So we need to really change our mindset on that. The mindset of performance will keep you bound, right? Will keep you in bondage and will stop your growth and your progress. Um, and, you know, performance is just a good indicator of, uh, you know, where you aren't in God's will. You know, when you're in God's will, it's easy. It's not about performance. You know, and, and so um, I'm going to move on uh, here to the next one. Uh, it is repentance from anxiety. All right? Um, there's a lovely beach there, you know, and you just sat at the beach, and uh, I just thought it's a great picture, you know. Um, learn to go to a beach, all right? Turn to, your, turn to someone around you and say, let's go to the beach. <laughs> you know, enjoy, enjoy life, all right? God has provided all things pertaining to life and godliness. And, and this is something, you know, um, just like performance is an indicator where you're not in the will of God, anxiety is an indicator where you need to develop your faith. Okay? And this is very important. Anxiety indicates where, if you're anxious about something, that means you need to develop your faith in that area. That's it. It's a great tool to find out where you need to develop your faith. And, um, you know, God said to me when I was writing this, he said, anxiety limits your ability to see eternity and the big picture. All right. Another failure of mine was I used to be very, very paranoid about uh, flying because <laughs> I'd watched a lot of air crash investigation. <laughs> you know, growing up, my dad was you know in the air force, and we would watch air crash investigation every every Wednesday night. It would be a Nat Geo, and we would watch it, and and that built this, you know, it's scary, isn't it? There's all these planes crashing every time, and I was terrified of flying, so this is one time, um, we were flying, I was, I was in, a, you know, one of these massive A380s, uh, you know, and, um, and, and they had like a route, it was over from Heathrow to Abu Dhabi, and on the same route to the previous day, there was a flight in A380 that was flying over, had to do an emergency landing, because the door started rattling. There was something wrong with the locking mechanism of the door, so they had an emergency landing on that route. And I'm flying on the same route the next day, and I'm sitting right next to the door, all right, because they have these many doors. And suddenly I hear rattle, 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 rattle. <laughs> Here's me in tongue, shaka, baba, 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 baba. Lord save me, <laughs> you know. And instantly the panic starts kicking in, you know, and the anxiety. Anxiety comes like, oh, this just happened yesterday. You know, and, and I'm not kidding you. The whole plane went silent, dead silent, because everyone was thinking, what is happening now? I was like a loud rattle, <laughs> and um, and the flight stewards all came running. And uh, turns out it was actually a seat that was attached to the door, not the door itself. I was rattling, <laughs> but you know, anxiety, you know, makes you forget. Now I, I was scared of fear. I was scared of death. You know, my fear was, I'm gonna die. 
and that helps you lose your anxiety, takes away your perspective of the eternal. What's going to happen if you die? You're going to be with Jesus. That's what makes you invincible. So whenever you have this anxiety, it's going to take away your perspective. It's going to shift your perspective. You know, you're going to start thinking, I'm going to die. Huh? Is that the verse that the devil can pull off? Is it really the worst he can pull off? That's fine. That's, I mean, we have defeated death. Death is under our feet, you know, and so we begin to walk in that, and, you know, anxiety is overcome. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, make your request known to God. You know, and, and I put that verse up, Isaiah 26, 3. It says, But you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. You know, Jesse Duplantis says, fear tolerated is faith contaminated. I'll say that again. Fear tolerated is faith contaminated. Every single time fear knocks at the door, I am telling you, open the door and kick him. <laughs> Send him back out onto the street. Do not even let him knock at your door. Fear is not supposed to be in a Christian's life. The Bible says, for I have not given you a spirit of fear. So who gave you that spirit? If the spirit of fear doesn't come from God, where is it coming from? From the devil. Amen. Washington's got his finger on the pulse. From the devil. You need to grab that devil and you need to shove him out and say, never come back to this house again. You know, you need to get off my lawn. You know, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, we're in Christmas time. Get off my lawn. Reminds brings me a lot of memories. But, you know, that, that's where we're supposed to be. Uh, we're supposed to be in a place where fear doesn't even have access to the lawn, right? Um, and the next, the final point I kind of wanted to touch on was uh, repentance from impersonation. And this is a uh, this is a big one, you know. It's a, you know everyone likes to put on a mask every now and again, you know, and likes to be like someone else. And a lot of people say, oh, you know, from this church there will be the next, uh, you know, Benny Hinn and the next Catherine Kuhlman and you know, that's all great. Yes, we want those anointings. We want those things. But we don't want to be the same. God has a call on each one's life that is unique. How do I know that? Psalm 139 verse 16. It says, Thine eyes did see my substance being yet unperfect. And in your book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there were none of them. A lot of other translations get this wrong. Do you know, I use this verse a lot um, to speak about uh, pro-life. Because it says, uh, a lot of translations say all the days were written. But if you go back to the Hebrew, if you go back to the original language, it's actually talking about the members of your body. So God has planned when your heart will be formed, when your lungs will be formed. That's why doctors can tell you six weeks, this is how the baby looks. Eight weeks, this is how the... Because God has already pre-planned when each member of... And that is how much he pours into you. Your liver is only your liver. <laughs> Your kidney is only your kidney. You don't believe me? Try to live without, without it. You know, you can't. Your thumbprint, hold up your thumb, right? And say, I am thumbthing special. <laughs> you know, I used to say that in Sunday school. I am thumbthing special. Nobody on this entire planet before you or after you has ever had the same thumbprint. Am I right, Paul? Yeah, yeah, that's the GP. He agrees with me. No one else has the same thumbprint. No one else has the same iris. No one else, first they should think it's only thumbprint. It's your iris, it's your tongue print, it's your, I mean, you know, almost everything is unique. No one else has your DNA, you know, and God has placed a unique call into your life, and this is where it gets really important. I'm, I'm straying off a wee bit, but this is why, you know, we believe in life begins at conception, because God has made a unique plan, and I'm telling you, some people are going to go to heaven, and they're going to say, why did you not cure cancer? Why did you not cure AIDS? And God is going to say, I put that unique plan in a baby's life, and you killed it, and that is a terrible thing. God has placed a unique call on every single person's life, every single, and we need to begin to discover and walk in that call. If you begin to impersonate people, you'll end up, you know, and this is my final failure where I began so anxious, you know, um, and so, you know, I, I used to try and live not like myself. I tried to put on a show for a lot of my life, and I ended up in counseling because I began to get anxious that 
people weren't liking me. I began to get paranoid about it, you know, and that brought such a close in the minute, you know, that shell, and, and, and I had to go, you know, and, and the Holy Spirit sent me to this spiritful lady for counseling, and she used to pray over me, you know, and she used to pray in tongues, and she used to speak over me and speak the word, and she would send me through the week, she would send me, uh, you know, just scriptures on a page, and she would send it out to me, and then when I would have, you know, the, the you know, in America, they call therapy. I have the sessions. She would, she would take out the scriptures and read them over me. And that began to rewire my mind to say that I am unique. And God has placed something great on the inside of me. God has placed something great. And you know, I love that song. It says, Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? You know, God had placed something amazing on the inside of Mary. You know, and God has placed something amazing on every single person in this church. Nobody else in this entire planet has the same unique calling that you have, you know, and, and I just believe, you know, um, you know, we, we, we need to understand that because Jeremiah says, and I just want to bring scripture into me, because Jeremiah says, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations before he was formed god had an amazing calling upon you know we aren't ordained by pastors or ministers we are ordained by god before the day we were born right and that is something so amazing you know and, and i just i just feel like you know I just feel like the Holy Spirit is going to minister to us. I think he's calling us to repentance. He's calling us to repentance from a mindset of deficiency. He's calling us to repentance from a mindset of infirmity. He's calling us to repentance from a mindset of performance. He's calling us to repentance from a mindset of anxiety. And he's calling us to repentance from a mindset of impersonation. And I believe the Holy Spirit is going to minister and he's going to visit people right now. But before that, Pastor Karen asked me to, I had this clip through the week. It was a beautiful clip of a young girl, five years old, who got baptized. And you know, this is the reason, because we're beginning, we're going to see revivals like this. So this is going to be the reason why we're going to need we're going to need this. We're going to need revival to begin in our minds. So if the media team just want to go to the next slide and run that clip. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to see it. I've seen cancer disappear. I've seen metal plates dissolve. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Because I've seen real life resurrection. I've seen mental health restored. Don't you tell me. Man, thank you, Jesus. And we're going to see that. I believe the revival that's coming is going to break out in Sunday schools and youth groups and young adults' lessons and women's nights and men's nights across this nation. We're going to believe for that. And we're going to, we're going to seek it out. And we're going to pray for that. And we're just going to have a time of ministry. So I'd ask you to join me on your feet. God is calling us to repentance as a church. Repentance, a change of mindset. I'm going to ask the media team to play that song softly in the background. And we're just going to believe God, we're going to believe God for repentance and we're going to say, God, I repent. I repent. I repent from, from a mindset that is not from you, Lord. I repent because I want to see that. I want to see kids, children, our children's children come and come into the Lord, wanting to be baptized, being filled with the Holy Spirit when they come out of the water. We want to see that. We want to see that. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, oh Lord. Hallelujah. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I believe God's calling some of you to repent. You can either come up to the front or you can kneel where you are right now and, and, and ask and say, Lord, I repent. I repent, Lord. I repent. Jesus. So a lot of people here have been called from a mindset of performance. God says you don't have to perform. I did it all. I did it all 100% on the cross. I accomplished everything. And God is saying, repent from that mindset of performance because I have done it all. I have done it all for you. There is nothing more you need to do. The devil has lied to you and said, you're not good enough. God is saying, repent from that. Lord, we want to see your power in us, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. There's some people who've lived for far too long in deficiency. And God is breaking off the curse of deficiency over your life right now. And I pray as you repent from the mindset of always living in fear of what's going to come, God is going to change and use you in this next great revival to see people's lives restored. God is getting ready for a wealth transfer into the church. I'm declaring that. I'm prophesying that over Kingdom Harvest right now. Every person who's in this church, God is bringing a transfer of wealth like we have never seen before. And he wants us to repent from a mindset of lack. He's done with a church that is lacking every time. God wants us to repent from that. Repent from a mindset of lack. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we thank you, Lord, that you're just making us firm again. You are our firm foundation, Lord. And we believe for those who've suffered from infirmity, Lord, the mindset of infirmity has been changed. And we can thank God that we are no longer sick, no matter what the symptoms are. You have changed the mindset of infirmity, Lord Jesus. You're wiping it out in the name of Jesus. We thank you for that, Lord, right now. Well, we don't see ourselves as sick trying to get healed. We are healthy fighting to keep our healing. We are the healthy ones of the Lord fighting to keep our healing. And Lord, I just minister that right now, Lord. Lord, if there's any sick, Lord, the mind will change today. From today, all chronic conditions, I speak to you in the name of Jesus. I take authority over you in the name of Jesus. For a long time, hope has been deferred. It has made the heart sick. I take authority over that and I declare healing in the mind in the name of Jesus. Healing beginning in the mind right now for families, people in your family family who've had it, if your children have had sickness for a long time, I declare a healing in your mind for that. You don't see them as sick anymore in the name of Jesus. You don't see them as sick anymore in the name of Jesus. You see them as the healed ones of the Lord, the healthy ones of the Lord. Change your mindset. Today is the day of repentance from a mindset of infirmity in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Lord, we just pray, Lord, for those who are anxious and who are, who are always trying to impersonate and be something else. Lord, I pray that you would remind them of their calling today, Lord. Remind them of their calling, Lord. The, the thing you ordained them for before they were even formed, Lord, you ordained them for something. Remind them of what that was today, Lord Jesus. Lord, let there be a change in the mind, Lord. Let them see clearly what you have ordained them for, Lord, today. And it's a great and mighty thing, Father. 
And church, I just, I just ask you, join me in praying. Let's just pray in the Holy Ghost because God is releasing revival in our minds today. I declare revival in our minds in the name of Jesus. Revival in our minds in the name of Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus, Lord. We will never think the same, Lord. We will never think the same after today, Lord Jesus. We will be changed. Bondages on the mind are broken in the name of Jesus. Bondages, I take authority over bondages of the mind and I destroy you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you are doing it with your people, Lord. Revival is beginning in our minds, Lord. In our minds, Lord Jesus. Anything the devil has whispered, Lord, we bind it in the name of Jesus and we declare the resurrection power of God in our minds today, Lord Jesus. We think resurrected. We walk resurrected. We believe believe resurrected we speak resurrected we declare it in the name of Jesus receive the resurrection power in your mind right now hallelujah hallelujah thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Lord thank you Holy Spirit thank you Jesus amen thank you Caleb amen that God amen brother God bless you God bless you God bless you don't you dare leave the way you came in here. <laughs> oh, man. Change for life. Amen? Change for life. Change for life. Now, just listen. I mean, that, that was a fresh word. A fresh word of the Holy Ghost. Amen? Because sometimes our thinking gets stale. It just does. It gets stale. <laughs> and then God comes in, man, with the wind of God and just blows away that staleness. Amen? Blows it away. Glory to God. We've got it, guys. Tell your neighbor you've got it. <laughs> you've got it. <laughs> Amen. Bless you. Bless you. And thank God for that wonderful word. Father, we just thank you that we are, we are changed forever. Changed forever, God, in the name of Jesus, Father. Amen. And we'll even go back and listen to that word again, God. We'll go back and listen to it again. Amen. Online, Father God, we'll keep it fresh. We'll keep it fresh in our hearts and in our minds, God. And we will walk in revival in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Hallelujah. Enjoy your fellowship. We'll make sure the heat's back on here. And uh, amen. Be blessed.